Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time to take global stories making headlines in our national dailies. And joining me to review the papers is Professor Chris Mustafa Wonkobia Jr. as a convener Country First Movement. Mr. Chris, thank you for joining us. Or oh, Prof. Good morning. My pleasure to be on with you. Always lovely having you. All right, so let's get straight into the papers. And today we'll be starting with The Guardian. Now, The Guardian leads with... 2023 election expenses, a year after, INEC, APC, PDP, 14 others, mom on financial disclosure. Now, um, the Electoral Act of 2022 um, mandated that all ex election expenses, you know, must be put to the INEC. Now, this is supposed to be submitted within the first six months, but we're seeing um, that even after six months, some of them have not been submitted, just the Labour Party and the um, Action Congress, the African Action Congress that have submitted theirs. But the ruling party, APC, PDP, um, NNPP, and all the others haven't submitted theirs. Even INEC hasn't come out to say, this is what we have done. Why do you think it's taking so long and doesn't just, um, doesn't this jettison the fact that the Electoral Act was there for a reason? Now, these parties are not even sticking to that. Let me say very importantly that uh, oftentimes when you see these, um, because it pales to us in impunity, when you see things like this happen, mm -hmm. it is because, um, and I say this almost uh, jocularly, that most of the parties do not actually know how much they spent. Um, some overreached themselves, some spent a trillions if you like and they boasted about it and all that uh, kind of expenses against the provisions of the electoral act so uh, they are unwilling to submit their report as uh, provided by the law because they do not want to be seen to be shooting themselves in the hip uh, and i do sincerely believe that uh, going forward what the uh, electoral umpire must do is to uh, keep a close tab on uh, the electoral processes, keep a close tab on the spendings of political parties, keep a close tab, maybe working in concert with the ICPC and the EFCC, that's the anti-corruption agencies. Uh, the reason the draftsman, the reason the, the law was uh, so drafted was simply to ensure that um, the electoral process is not heavily monetized, to ensure that um, the political parties are not special multipurpose vehicles for money laundering and corruption to ensure that um, people uh, uh, people elect their leaders a free fair and square. But almost unfortunately, like you noted, more of the parties that were in the electoral contestation have not submitted their report. Interestingly, almost uh, surprisingly, uh, my party, the Labour Party, as, as it were, uh, met with the provisions of the law and have submitted. Hmm. So, with the with the all progressive um, um, APC, you know, because they're the ruling party, don't you think they're supposed to be setting a precedent to ensure that even other parties follow? Because you can't be the one at the elm of the affairs, and then you're not even doing what the law is required. And then why is INEC not even, you know, breathing down their necks, basically, and saying, you need to do this? Because if it's on paper, if we have a constitution, we should stick by it. Don't you think so? It's hardly full, man. The... APC, the ruling party, has always set examples in the breach. Sadly, they have always, uh, you know, if you look at the records in nine months, or uh, now perhaps uh, ten months, yeah. what we have is a litany of the absurd. Uh, what we have is record in the negative. And so, uh, why would this be different? <laughs> they want to uh, keep up a laughing uh, stock. They want to make us uh, a butt of jokes for on every. I expect them to be the last to submit their their records. I actually do. Um, that is if they submit at all. Hmm. All right. Um, so I'm going to move over to another story, still on the Guardian, and this one talks about Tinubu constitutes teams to revive 
the economy. Now, to boost this economy, the president has established a comprehensive um, economic coordination and planning system for the country. But then we see time and time again where you know, whoever is in power will come and say, you know what, this is what we want to do. Um, we love to constitute, you know, just having those people or planning system or whatever you're going to talk, call it the teams. But then we're not really seeing enough actions being put in place. What do you think about this story? No, let me say that uh, very uh, commendably, um, now that the dollar is losing strength against the Naira, I hope it continues. And then people are wont to saying that, oh, the economic policy of government is gradually gaining traction or gaining, uh, making results. And But I want to say that it is important that we see beyond just the, the gaining of strength of the Naira and look at the entire economic uh, fabric of the nation and maybe that's why he's looking at uh, overhauling the economic team because um, uh, when you look at I, I, I threw a joke yesterday at some friends of mine I said okay if the Naira is gaining strength why is nothing coming down apart from just a few days ago we heard that the NMPC had released a new price regime for I don't know whether that's taking off I don't know whether people have started buying at the new rate but what is important is that uh, and that's why the, the movement that represents country first movement is beyond partisanship for me. Uh, if this government sits up to doing what is proper, try to write, Nigeria will favor everybody. Uh, the question most people ask is, can this government do right? And I think that if we wake up... Okay, I think we've lost um, Professor Chris's um, audio, but I hope he joins us back really soon. We've just been reviewing the papers, and um, I was talking about the fact that the president has constituted new teams to drive the economy or to revive the economy, and my question to him was, um, I know the, well, we're having a conversation that the, the Naira is gaining strength against the dollar, but I mean, what are the ways we're going to revive the economy? And most times you hear, you know what, we're creating this team, we're creating that team to do this, to do that. But how effective, what is the impact? We've not really seen so much impact. And then obviously the president has been there for 10 months. But uh, well, we're hoping that, you know, all of the sacrifices that he's asked us to make, we start to pay, we start to see dividends for that. So that was on that story. And I just hope um, Professor Chris comes back to just um, shed more light on that. Um, prior, before he comes back, let me just take some other stories here on The Guardian. And um, well, one says, Oanese threatens to sue federal government over extra states for Southeast. Another one says, no reduction in petrol or diesel prices, NMPCL affirm and then pcl affirms um i mean i was looking at this on social media and i know that there was some story making rounds in social media saying the nmpcl have reduced or pump prices have been reduced by 10 naira and so the nmpcl has come out to say no that is not true um the prices remain there is no reduction in any of these prices so whoever is you know moving around with that sort of propaganda please disregard such information no that is not true another story here says military carried out no reprisal in okwama other communities says tinubu okay i think we have prof now hello prof can you hear me i think i can hear you okay fantastic um so i was just asking about i mean the story we were on um says tinubu constitutes teams to revive economy now I was just asking, like, what's the impact going to be? Because obviously we see that this team is being set up, but the economy still looks the same way it is, or maybe sometimes dwindling. But how are they going to revive this economy and the impact that even the common man will start to see in the coming months or, well, I would say months because years, years is too long. No, let me say very importantly that if uh, the government is in Xi'an, and committed to its policy programmatic. If they get a fantastic economic team and they are ready to follow through, not to ask the Nigerian people to tighten their seatbelt whilst they continue to buy foreign-made goods, 
while they continue, while they continue to import vehicles, while they continue to uh, run a bloated government, if they tighten their seatbelts first and uh, lead by example, certainly the economy will grow. Certainly things will get better. Um, like I said, it is commendable to see that the Naira is gaining strength against the dollar. It's also commendable to hear that the uh, price of petroleum products is coming down. Uh, I pray that this government consistently pursue uh, pro-masses and pro-people policy programmatic. If they do, uh, things will get better. But I, uh, my optimism uh, fails to a bit of insignificance if uh, you look at how those who superintend uh, different ministries, you hear allegations of uh, budget padding, overspending, uh, you hear issues about uh, lack of commitment to pro-masses and pro-people policy programmatic. And on the one hand, government is saying we're going to do everything to make sure that the economy gets better. On the other hand, you see ministers who are involved in, in opulence and profligacy, uh, and I wonder how you reconcile that. So I, I think that the time has come for government to live true to what it says on paper, and if it does so, if it gets eggheads and, and, and brilliant minds and economic experts to manage the economy, things will definitely, definitely get better. Well, we're hoping for that because on the punch, it says um, President's 50-member emergency teams get six months to rescue the economy. And there's a small writer that says Shetima, 13 ministers, five governors, Dangote, Elumelu, others make the list. So hopefully um, they get to rescue the economy and we just start to see it get better because I'm sure Nigerians are tired. Um, there's no money. Things are expensive. Um, anything that you just want to do, it, you, it's just debit a lot everywhere. But yes, we're hoping that the economy gets revived. And even for manufacturers as well, you're seeing manufacturers leaving the country um, because the economy might not just be sustainable for them. They're not, you know, in a, they don't have a better or a thriving environment to, to have their their companies, but we're just hoping that the economy gets revived and things start to get better. So I'm going to move over to another story, um, which talks about um, Kanu State, and this says, Hajj Fair Hike. Kanu announces 1.4 billion Naira subsidy for intending pilgrims. Now, I think it's about 500,000 Naira, um, yes, for each of the pilgrims to, for them going to Hajj. And at this point, I think it's about 2,900 people who are interested. But why are we sending people to Mecca or to Jerusalem, especially when we have an economy that is dwindling? Because I'm, I'm talking about this because we're still on the whole economy um, issue. If we have an economy and we're still we're trying to cut costs, you know, cut the cost of governance um, and, you know, anything that comes with it, shouldn't things like this be taken out? Because we know you cannot be spending what you don't have. What do you think about this, Prof? Well, let me say this, that um, one of the greatest tragedy of our country is the fact that we have become more uh, Islam than Prophet Muhammad, peace be unto him. Mm. We've become more religious, more Christian than Jesus the Christ, peace be unto him. Mm. We're a nation that plays politics with uh, what should affect our entire sense, which is religion. We play politics with everything that has to do with uh, proper conduct and decency. There are a whole lot of people who are hungry in Kano State. Mm. There are a whole lot of people who uh, that 500,000 can help start a business. But you see, because... Uh, like uh, one of our popular artists sang a long time ago, religion, not politics, you know. People have chosen, rather than address fundamental issues of state, to uh, um, pander towards the confines and contours of religion. And very unfortunately, our country suffers. Very unfortunately, the young people who should benefit from... Uh, if the, just imagine if these funds were put into a widow support account or... Uh, job creation uh, uh, initiative. Mm. What will happen in the next four or five years? Allow me to so chip in. Allow me to chip in here a little bit. So um, I think last week or earlier this week, I saw on social media um, there was a video making rounds, which was the kind of state governor um, moving around this mosque because they were fasting, and so they had. Um, 
you know, made provisions for them to break their fast with food. And then it was moving around and saying, you know what, what is this? This is horrible. Why are you serving this? I mean, it was a good act, definitely, that, you know, he's, he's looking at, he's looking at the, the plight of his people, wanting to feed them and all of that. But then my question at that point was, it's a good act, but is it the right act at the right time? Because we're saying we need to cut, you know, costs, but now you're feeding people for fasting. I mean, I'm a Christian. If I'm fasting, obviously, I'm going to break my fast by myself. If you want to give me some form of palliative to say, you know, you want to alleviate the sufferings of the people, that's fine. But when you now turn it from political to like a very religious act is what I just did not understand. And I just wanted to put that out there. So when you're speaking, you can also have that sort of information. You know, there's something about our nation that bothers me and troubles the carapace of my mind. And that is why we should put religion ahead of the well-being of our people. Mm. Why we should put religion ahead of... And I, let me say this. Prophet Muhammad, peace be unto him, said a long time ago that uh, the fundamentals of our faith, you know, which is that you have to pay the worker before night time you know you have to ensure that you give him good pay then you have to ensure that he has food you know government has left these fundamentals and they would rather spend billions in funding pilgrimage mm. you know christians do that when it's time to go to jerusalem about so some states have decided to do that about this time that's when they go to jerusalem the muslims do that when it's time to go to Mecca. and and then you ask yourself um how does this directly impact the nation I make you laugh, Fuma. We're the most religious nation in the world, about the most religious, after Afghanistan, you wonder. And then you ask yourself, uh, what has religion really done at the political level? Mm. I'm looking forward to seeing Muslims who truly believe in the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be unto him, who truly love their neighbors and live true to the teachings of Holy Quran and the Hadith. I would love to see Christians who live true to the teachings of, of, of Jesus the Christ and and make lives better for their neighbors. But Fuma, with all this religion and all the churches and mosques everywhere, uh, corruption is the highest. Uh, corruption <laughs> is become um, the new uh, color of our nation. And then beyond that, there's poverty, disease, despondency, and decay. And we are the country with the highest poor population of the highest poor uh, in the world. And mm -hmm. you ask yourself, this is a nation blessed by God with amazing resources and riches right. in the people. This is a country so pretended by Muslims and Christians who pray every day. This is a country, it's a contrast of uh, benumbing and befuddling dimensions. You're very religious. You do not take care of your nation. You're very religious. You steal monies belonging to the people. You're very religious. You do not tarot. You're very religious. Nothing impacts the man who's next door. So I, I think that the time has come for us to be true to uh, power and say, say it as it is. Uh, we are the worst species of political operators, mm -hmm. and by extension, the most pretentious and hypocritical people with respect to religion. Uh, I, I would lampoon uh, His Excellency Yusuf, the governor of Kano State. I'll tell him to put that money and the others who are doing the same thing, put that money in a trust account for the people of Kano State and, and the other states. People should wake up to the reality of now. Life is of no significance if governance and, and the resources of the people do not impact directly uh, on the lives of the people. I, I'm not excited about a hypocrisy in religion or deceit and chickenery in the name of God. You know, the time has come for us to wake up to the realities of the 21st century. Uh, Saudi Arabia is the home of Islam. Uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, UAE, you know, Dubai, uh, religious, uh, Islamic nations, but you don't read such things from them. Mm -hmm. They are concentrated in making life better for their people. They are working uh, in tandem with the realities of the 21st century. And uh, that's exactly what life should be here. Um, mm -hmm. Until we live true to those uh, intentions and intentment of the Constitution and the law, until we provide for the masses of our people, those who preach religion are just uh, at best hypocritical. Well, I cannot say that I, I do not agree with you because, yes, like you said, 
Um, you should be thinking of how to make lives better. That should be our concentration, not just, you know, dousing money and saying you're sending people abroad for a pilgrimage. I mean, there are other things we're trying well, to me, cut costs. Let me add this. Sorry, I'm not interrupting you for me. It's fine. My mentor, Martin Luther King Jr., said a long time ago that he doesn't want to hear about the beautiful streets of gold in heaven. Mm. He was a preacher, a reverend. He said, do not ask me about the beautiful streets of gold in heaven. Ask me about what streets people live on. Mm. Ask, do not tell me about the marriage feast of the lab and the, the banquet and the dinner in heaven. Ask me about what food people eat here on earth. Yeah. Do not tell me about the beautiful robes in heaven. Tell yeah. me, talk to me about the At the, the, the current realities. The current you know, that's realities. That's the fundamental of faith. Yeah. Anything other than that is hypocrisy and Phariseeism. Okay, let's move over to another story. Um, this one is still on The Guardian and is at the bottom. It says, Falano issues Akpabio's seven-day ultimatum to reinstate Ningi or face lawsuits. What do you think about this? I mean, we know all that has happened in the National Assembly with um, Ningi coming out and talking about the budget padding and um, all of that, all the rockers that happened in the past few weeks. But what do you think about this with Falano's statement saying the Ningi has to be reinstated within seven days or else... Um, Makwabi will be facing a lawsuit from him. Let me say that I I align with the Leonard Silk uh, Femi Falana, and I align with Sarah. Yes. And several people in the social space who have said to the Senate that you have no moral right to suspend uh, Ningi. And fundamentally, uh, yeah, Ningi may not have been a saint. He may have been provoked that some people got 500 million, some got 1 billion mm. without him as a ranking senator getting anything. But it is better that somebody spoke out for some reason than that the whole National Assembly is mom. And we have come to sympathize with him. We have come to believe that uh, this era and regime of body party must be made shibole. But fundamentally, um, the Northern uh, senators have spoken. The civil society has spoken. But you know, there's a converse side to this whole coin that bothers me. Uh, a, few days after, a few days after the call for his reinstatement, the president came out to say that the integrity of the National Assembly is intact. And I wonder what he meant mm -hmm. with and by that statement. Uh, I wonder what integrity this National Assembly, that is at best a rubber stamp of the executive, has. And I wonder what the president was trying to achieve. But let me say this, that a National Assembly that brought to, uh, uh, that passed an appropriation bill that provides for one borehole to cost as much as one round for the four million naira, one borehole that should not cost more than five million. One street light, I don't know whether the street light goes as far as heaven and takes light from heaven will cost as much as 188 million. That National Assembly is suspect. And I will align with not just the legal action, but peaceful action against the Senate and the National Assembly uh, until that man who spoke out about the humongous budget budget pardon at the National Assembly is restated. We need to understand that the provision of the uh, national of the legislature is not only to pass laws for the order and good governance of the country but to serve as an oversight of the executive. They, they have to see that whatever funds are appropriated are uh, effectively utilized. They have to see that uh, the executive it does its job fair and square. They also have to see that uh, our country is run according to law. But fundamentally, there's an error that we have seen in the National Assembly since 1999. It's become worse now. I don't know when lawmakers became contractors and there is a fraud in the name of constituency allowances where lawmakers take as much as two billion, three billion in the name of uh, uh, funds meant for constituency development. Uh, I don't know when they became executives. I don't know where and when their jobs went beyond lawmaking and oversight functions. And so fundamentally, we must begin to ask that the National Assembly lives truth to the provisions of the Constitution, and we must collectively fight this orgy of corruption in the National Assembly, which is a budget pardon. 
And we must align with uh, the senior lawyer, the Leonard Silk, and several other uh, civil society organizations who are saying that uh, Ningi must be reinstated. In asks Akpabio and his crew and his team and his fellow travelers on the part of Lasseni and Infemi to do what is proper, try to write. Right. I mean, like you rightly said, we must fight corruption, especially in the National Assembly, because most times those people in power are they they mirror the citizens or rather the citizens mirror the people in power so if i see that you know right. someone who is in the senate can do this i would just also be like you know what i can do this as well after all um he wasn't prosecuted nobody brought him to books um so i can get away with it and if we don't start to hold people accountable then what kind of nation are we are we, you know, having? And we don't want that. We want a nation that is better. We want a nation with quality citizens and people who have integrity because integrity matters a lot. So um, I'm going to move over to the Daily Trust. On the Daily Trust, it leads with tears as slain military personnel buried in Abuja. The writer here says, heartless people took away our breadwinners. Those are from the families. Um, another one says, deceased officers get national honors, kids scholarship. And on the punch, it also, it's the leading story, and it says, slain soldiers burial, Tinubu insists on killers arrest as families demand justice. The writers here says, killers won't go unpunished. President vows, confers, posthumous national honor on slain soldiers. Federal government orders benefit payments within 90 days. Families get scholarship, houses, COAS months. I mean... When I read this story earlier today, I was just commending the president for being empathetical towards the families because obviously if they have kids, their breadwinner is gone and you know, you need to make sure that you train your kids to school. Now they are not going to be present in those kids' lives. But knowing that the president is empathetical towards the families and saying, you know what, well, we're going to give you scholarships to the university level, I think it is really, really commendable. But I want to just get your take on all of this and, you know, even what kind of investigation we should be expecting into matters like this. I salute the honors given to the families and the, and the souls of the slain military personnel. I salute the attention. I salute the compassion and yeah. uh, empathy, if you like. Uh, and I commend our servicemen, I commend the military for their efforts at uh, stemming uh, the audio of violence, conflict, terror, banditry, and villainy in our country. But fundamentally, uh, what worries me for me is that our country has become a killing field of sorts. What worries me deeply is that uh, instead of stew, we have blood. Mm -hmm. What worries me is that everywhere, um, banditry, uh, villainy, and brigandage just become the order of the day. What worries me is that every time you hear government make promises, they almost always fail to keep to them. What bothers and brings tears down my eyes is the breadwinners are taken out, husbands are taken out, um, uh, sons are taken out and families are left to grieve. What bothers me is deeply the fact that uh, young ladies, young girls are made widows and uh, there's a terrible, terrible failure of state in the area of security, in the area of protection of lives and property. And uh, after one ordeal, you hear nice words and then the cycle continues and instead of deeply and committedly dealing with these issues uh, they continue it's become uh, the business across our nation uh, like i said my heart goes out to the families of the lost soldiers and but i want a situation where this ends mm. or it's reduced to the barest minimum you know, you don't tell me, okay, you're going to take, if you don't stop it, if you don't deal with it decisively, if you, if you don't collaborate with several uh, established uh, uh, countries who, are, who have been able to win such wars. Remember what ISIS had turned Iraq to until um, the combined effort of international forces and local forces 
dealt with it and sacked ISIS from Iraq. We have seen where uh, even Egypt had to collaborate with Israel on some score regarding issues at the Golan Heights and several other places where, uh, and that was the reason the kind of terror you see everywhere in the Middle East doesn't exist around that axis. We have seen where the Americans and even the British have offered to collaborate with our people under Buhari and Jonathan, Israel offered to help, uh, South Africa even offered to help. You know, until we effectively and dispassionately look at these issues, until we uh, decide to deal with criminality, because if you know and understand the anatomy of what happened in the South-South, and particularly my home state of Delta, uh, you will understand that there is suspicion of criminality, bunkering, oil theft, and then a conspiracy of sorts between local uh, uh, militants, some segment of the military, and it's, it's, um, it's a jambalaya of sorts, uh, heartbreaking information coming out of that axis, and unfortunately, a man fell in the crossfire, and I'm using these words deeply, Hmm. The crossfire that was not only about military weaponry, a crossfire that had to do with oil thefts and the like, a crossfire that had to do, deal with uh, uh, sabotage, a crossfire that had to deal with uh, uh, criminal elements fighting for superiority and interest. And it's uh, a jambalaya of sorts, like I said. And I think that the time has come for the president time has come for the military high command to look at um, issues around oil theft mm. in the Niger Delta. And beyond that, uh, across our country, you find uh, that there is a new trade, kidnap or ransom. Soldiers and policemen are being killed uh, in the line of duty because there is some kind of conspiracy between those who kidnap or ransom and those who are otherwise supposed to protect the people. So I, I believe that the time has come for Mr. President and indeed because the book stops at, at his desk yeah. to raise the bar and call those who should pretend our security architecture to do what is proper, try to write. We must understand that the provision, that the Constitution says that more than anything, the first responsibility, the basic responsibility of government is the protection of lives and properties. Nigerians must not continue to go uh, down their graves, albeit untimely, because of the failure of state. Mm. Okay, another headline on the punch. It says, NLC faults Abure's return. LP, that's the Labour Party, tips will be for 2027. And on the Daily Trust, it's also there. It says, Labour Party reserves 2027 presidential ticket for OB re-elects Aburi. I mean, you are part of the Labour Party, or you know some of the things that are going on there. And last week, we saw that the NLC had shut down the headquarters. There's been some form of brokers about um, Aburi, you know, resigning and stepping down. But we're seeing him get re-elected. Now, some members have come out to say there was no local government congress, there was no, sent, there was no state congress. Um, so how was he being elected? Who elected him? But I want to get your take on this because you're, you're part of them. You, I'm sure you have some information on what's going on. Well, man, what happened in uh, Newe in Anambra State mm. uh, was a village meeting. What happened in Newe was uh, a circus show. Um, you don't call a meeting of your supporters uh, a national convention. For me, you won't believe that not one elected delegate was at that convention. You won't believe that the presidential candidate of a party in the last election was not at that convention. You won't believe that the only governor elected under the Labour Party was not there. You won't believe that no senator, we have about nine senators or so, no senator was there. You won't believe that not one of the 38 members of the House of Representatives was there. And you ask yourself, what kind of convention was that? Not one member of the House of Assembly. We have several members of the House of, House of, 
in across the nation, Houses of Assembly. Not one was there. So Abri must have had a feast of sorts with his uh, supporters, and that would definitely not stand. Uh, interestingly, like you read, uh, the Board of Trustees of a party has taken over the leadership of a party as provided by the Constitution. Um, um, Aburi is uh, on a frolic of his own, on a voyage of his own, and uh, very soon, and it won't take long, you'll find out that uh, the charade in the Navy, superintended by Aburi and his fellow travelers, will pale to nothing. Uh, the Labour Party will come out of this better because um, he who must, uh, he who demands right, must do right. He who wants a better country must lead by examples, you know. And um, that is why some of us are not troubled, some of us are not bothered. He has decided to engage in a dance macabre, and uh, the people will help drum him to, uh, to, to oblivion. That's exactly what he's chosen. And um, the Labour Party is not troubled. Uh, the Board of Trustees has taken over the leadership of, and I've written to INEC and, uh, and those who should know. And, in fact, from today, there is leadership in Labour Party, so pretended uh, by the Board of Trustees of the party, and Abri and his co-travelers can perhaps go rent another office and continue to uh, to play, uh, to dance to the media and delude, denude, and deceive themselves. Um, I'm going to move over to the Nation newspaper. And on the nation, the leading headline here says, Governor is talking about this Danfer state governor, says, my state epicenter of kidnapping and banditry. So let's just talk about some security matters a little bit. What is the main problem? I mean, so Olusegun Obasanjo, the former president of Nigeria, had, you know, ascribed unemployment to um, the reason why there's a rise in kidnapping, terrorism, insurgency, whatever you're going to call it. But why are we not tackling this as much as we would expect? We have security agencies. Why are they not really? Because for me, I, I think, especially with the one that happened in January, those people made distress calls for like over four hours. Nobody responded to them. How do you kidnap, you know, a, a boss of or, or 200 and something school children, move them? How did they move from one state to another? Um, so my question is, how, what are we doing? Why is there no intelligence? Why are we not, um, you know, arresting these kidnappers or these bandits? What are we doing with our security architecture in Nigeria? Why can't we see, um, because you had rightly mentioned that the basic um, thing for the government is to ensure that they protect the lives and properties of Nigerians. So why are we not seeing them take that seriously to ensure that everyone feels safe in Nigeria? Well, man, I will ask the questions with some kind of posers. Uh, are human beings too small that you have over a hundred persons walking in the forest and there are no intelligence? Yeah. Are human beings that infinitesimal that people will move 200 and something school children and you don't have intelligence? Are they that fast that they will go through from one state to the other through the forest? and you won't have intelligence. Yeah. Or do they ferry them uh, with uh, African magic, juju, and so, such that uh, they are able to move from state to state unnoticed? Mm. There's a massive conspiracy that we have in this thing called banditry. You know, the new business in town after right. larceny and routine in politics is kidnap for ransom. And the, there's a segment of the security architecture that is complicit. There is a segment of political leadership that is complicit. And until we decide to do what is proper, until we decide to protect Nigerians, uh, this will not stop. You know, I've heard security experts analyze the anatomy of the crisis that we have, particularly in the Northwest and the Northeast, and now it's shifting deeply to the North Central. We hear about. Uh, people closing their businesses in the state of Kogi and uh, and Quara. And it bothers me, it troubles me deeply, because um, now that we're talking about economic recession, pain, hunger, and disease, people who should otherwise fend for their families uh, are forced to close shop. So poverty will increase 
uh, despondency, depression, disease will increase. And uh, I think that what we must all begin to do as a people, uh, if we truly care about our country, is to ask Mr. President uh, and those who superintend the police, mm. who superintend our security architecture, the DSS, the Army, to collaborate more effectively and bring this to an end. Uh, Pumed is also a part that should worry all of us. You know, beyond the the conspiracy and the complicit uh, nature of uh, those who are involved and the, those in government, the banking sector. Mm. When you hear about hundreds of millions, when you hear about millions of naira being uh, handed these uh, bandits and militants and those who are involved in this kidnap ransom. You ask yourself, where does this money come from? Right. To where and how? And where do they end up? You know, so there has to be a major, major collaboration between uh, government, the security agencies, and the banks. We must say to those who do this terrible business, we must say to those who are impish and demonic. We must say to those who do not care about lives and the sanctity and safety of human lives and emotions. We must say to those who have turned uh, the lives of people to a business mm. that this is incongruent with the realities of the 21st century. We must so to say to them that civilized society talks about primacy of lives and the protection of lives and property. Civilized Society talks about uh, safety of human, the human personnel. You know, when you see the pictures, my heart bled when I saw those kids coming out of uh, uh, captivity. Young girls, young boys, faces fall on. And then I wrote a piece some time ago. I said, blood for steel. It's so bad that uh, what also bothers me is the fact that some young girls, and for me, this will affect you emotionally, but this is good for our nation to, to look at it. A young girl who's growing up, 13, 14, is perhaps taken into captivity by this wicked and murderous urchins. Mm. He is perhaps a virgin. Yeah. And have been defiled by this smelling, ragtag, demonic operators. And every day of her life, she curses the nation. She curses those who, you know, this country has a lot of problems. I keep telling people that the blood of a child, the blood of an innocent, means a lot. And that takes me to the metaphysics of building nations. If every day young people who should be protected by the nation are defiled and molested and messed up, and every day they lay curses on our nation, we must wake up to the fact that divinely, we must tell God that we're interested in purging our nation and getting our nation right. Yeah. And then as human beings, we must make a commitment to ensuring that this ceases. As human beings, we must make a commitment to protecting our young girls and our young boys. As human beings, we must make a commitment to ensuring that there is primacy of lives and properties in this country. And that's the minimum. This whole orgy of violence, this terrible situation that obtains across our country demands. Leadership must rise to the challenge and do what is proper, right and right. Okay. Leadership must rise to the challenge and do what is proper and right. I love that because that is just what we need in Nigeria. In fact, in all of all of our sects, so from the economic sector to security to infrastructure, you know, just rise up to the challenge and do what's right. And we'll just have a nation that is flourishing, that is thriving, and that people can even come in and be happy about and say, yes, we're moving to Nigeria. We want to be part of the story in Nigeria, and that would be amazing. We want to say thank you for coming. It was lovely reviewing the papers with you this morning. Thank you so much. The pleasure is mine. God bless Nigeria. God bless Nigeria. All right, we've been speaking with Professor Chris Mustafa Wonkobia Jr. He's the convener, Country First Movement. And we've just been reviewing the papers, talking about security stories, um, also economic stories, and all of the global stories making headlines in our national day. We'll go on a short break, and when we return, we'll be looking at our first hot topic. Please stay with us.
Hello, hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.